Make sure you check out our online store where we work with our graphic designer to create stunning garment and product designs that feature a wide variety of aircraft types such as British fighters, World War II aircraft, American bombers, Russian fighters and much more. You can pick your favourite designs and personalise any items within our Redbubble store that range from clothing right the way through to stationery. All of our designs feature our logo so you can show your support for the channel while getting a quality product. You can head to our website aircrewinterview.tv and click store or go to redbubble.com forward slash people forward slash AC interview. Thank you and enjoy. After you finished with the big and you went to Australia for uh, for a bit, didn't you, before you got the call to say, like, do you want a fancy uh, flying grip? Yeah. So tell us about yeah. that story, like how why you went to Australia. Yeah, that that's uh, it's an interesting uh, uh, part of my life, of course. But well, it, at the start of the two thousand two thousand, well, everybody thought in Sweden at least that well, it, war is never going to happen any any yeah. anymore, and everything is peachy, and uh, we call it the pink times, and everything was fluffy, you know. Uh, so we had a lot lot of uh, uh, cut downs in the air force, and and uh, I said we had one hundred and forty hours per pilot that we were down to, I think eighty or sixty at the end uh, there. Uh, in 2003, and then they um, they uh, actually shut down the Uppsala wing. They op- they're open reopening it now, but uh, they shut yeah. down the Uppsala wing. So I was kind of like a oh, bummer. So I was actually the last one at the squadron. I you know picked everything together and uh, and moved out from the squadron. But then my wife got an assignment. She works at Saab. She got an exi- assignment in Australia. So I was actually uh, uh, given the chance to follow her to Australia and be. Uh, a home man, so to say, uh, mm-hmm. just uh, the following supporting uh, a spouse. So I thought, well, that's great. Uh, I didn't have a, a place to um, uh, to do conversion training for the Gripen at the time because they were all full. Everybody wanted to fly the Gripen and the, the Vigan was phased out. So I thought, this is a great time. Uh, I have nothing to do. So let's move to Australia. So, and then I lived there for a year and a half. Yeah, it's quite a long time. Did you enjoy your time over in Australia? Oh, yes. Yeah. Australia is, uh, I think it's it's a fantastic land, a country, and uh, I mean it's warm, which we are not uh, so accustomed to <laughs> in Sweden, thing. of course. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that was great, uh, and the people are so nice in Australia as well. It's easy, outgoing, and uh, well, we loved it. Every everything of it, and we lived lived uh, just by the beach as well. So it was a really fun time, and no no kids at the time, so uh, we could do Pokemon. wherever we want. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so there was a lot of uh, going around. We've seen uh, most of Australia, I think. Wow, that's very cool, Duke. So let's talk about the gripping. So, what were your first thoughts on the gripping itself? Well, I, had, I think I had a little bit of mixed feelings because for the Viggen, you kind of prouded yourself of being able to take as much angle of attack. It was uh, had a maximum angle of attack at twenty three degrees, and you kind of you had a lot of uh, advantage if you could stay on those exact twenty three degrees and not go back to 22 and 21 and you had right. a, a small yeah. gauge that you could actually uh, well you try to keep it as close to 23 as possible so that was kind of you learned um, that as a craft and you were became uh, pretty good at it and uh, when you go to the gripen you didn't need that because you could just pull the stick backwards and the aircraft since it was totally carefree handling you could just pull the stick back and solve the problem for you you couldn't over g or you couldn't o- over angle attack either Wow. So that was kind of like, how fun will this be? I, don't, I mean, it's just pull the back, pull the 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 stick backwards and uh, see where it, what happens. Yeah. But then, of course, you, you everything. It was not like that at all. But what uh, you could still be a, a a bad and a good uh, fighter pilot in the in the grip, and it's just you just did different things. You you didn't concentrate on the angle of attack. You concentrated on the the big picture instead. It was less uh, you know top gun uh, dog fighting and more beyond visual range uh, chess playing so to say which is the how you do it today of course yeah so what was the intended role or is the role of the gripping in the swedish air force i think uh, the gripping does it all since it was actually designated in swedish the jas gripen yeah. which means fighter uh, strike and surveillance, uh, recce. Uh, then, yeah. uh, so it's uh, and it was really touted to be the new aircraft that does it all. 
all three things, and you can even switch in there. It had even ha- even had a J A S button, yeah, so you right, could yeah, you, you like could the, press you could yeah. press the buttons and just reconfigure the the aircraft. And of course, it didn't change the weapons. But I mean, if you had a, a, a fighter loadout, you couldn't just uh, get bombed suddenly. But it, it changed some things in in the handling on, and on the screens and everything. So it's supposed to do everything, and it still does. So we have one aircraft to, for all the operational uh, uh, sorties. So it does like almost everything, which is uh, yeah. Is it multi role, om- omni role? I don't know, like what it would be classed as. No, I, I think it would be classed as omni role today because uh, you can do multiple roles at a time. You, you basically, uh, you, you, when we go out with a four four ship to do uh, air to ground missions, for instance, you you just you you have four, all four of them start with the uh, uh, offensive counter air, for instance, and then the one that has or the two that has has to have have to happen to have the bombs uh, under the wings. When they can just go down and uh, 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 fire the, the bombs. Yeah, and yeah. So let's talk a bit about your ground training on the Gripen. How did it compare? You know, I mean, you've been away in Australia at this time. What was it like coming back and then flying like a, I guess a, a four point five generation aircraft compared, you know, to the Viggen? Like, was the ground training a lot different? No, it's actually quite similar because we have a, a, the way where that we we do things in Sweden. We we kind of have a, a thing that we you start you always start all new mission types with uh, going into the simulator, and then you have the first you have the of course the theory session. Yeah. Then you have, do it in the simulator. Then some sort is you do it with a backseat instructor, and then you do it yourself. And this is how we do it for all things. And it was the same on the Viggen and uh, as for the Gripen. So. The, the simulator was a lot better, of course. We had a full, full-on simulator with a, with a big dome and everything. So you put on all the gear and everything, and it really felt like being in, in the aircraft. But we also had a simple ver- simpler version that you just could, you know, jump into, and, and uh, that was reasonably good. And uh, what models did you start training on? Uh, was it? I'm guessing the A and B. And can you tell us about the time you first, you know? kicked in that burner in you know in the grip and that must have been an amazing feeling oh yeah yeah exactly i started on the ab version because it was the only one at the time uh, and uh, of course the, the acceleration especially uh off the uh when you started on the runway was was a uh, more impressive than uh even the the vegan the the Gripen had, had it more from the beginning that the Gripen had a really good accel- no sorry the Viggen had a really good acceleration on low level when it was really cold and uh, maybe above uh, let's say uh, 300 knots then it was really really would really really accelerate well but the Gripen yeah. accelerates pretty well all over the, uh, the the speed spectrum yeah well it's a bit different because uh, fighter uh, operations that's more it's a different way of thinking. You kind of you get thrown into it, and you have to react on what you see and what you do. It's like a chess yeah. play. Uh, on the other hand, air to ground is that's more planning, and you have to put a lot more uh, into your planning, and you have to sit at the computer, and you have yeah. to be a bit. Uh, you know, let's try this a little bit, and let's try that a little bit, and then you just go out and do it. And if you've done the proper preparations, it's kind of easy to do it uh, out. So. It, there's different skills. It's just uncommon for a fighter, fighter pilot to uh, to do the, the strike missions from the beginning because it feels yeah. a little bit boring. But but after a while, you kind of well, th- those guys that had done this for their whole career, they are really good, and they they, yeah. they have nailed down all those little nuances. Yeah. So you had a lot to learn from them. So it was just sh- shift of uh, mindset, I guess, to put more effort into the planning. So let's talk about the Gripen's handling. Like, what was it like to fly? And yeah, how did it differ compared to, you know, the big bulky Viggen? Yeah, well, it, the, the the Gripen is a lot smaller, of course. And you can see that visually, but it also carves a lot better in, in the air, so to say. So if you don't do a downhill skiing, for instance, you, you can, uh, if you, if, when you're turning, you can kind of... Uh, turn in one way then there's a lot of uh, throw ups from the the snow and everything or you can yeah. carve and 
and then there's you you barely touch the snow and and the, you just go faster and faster it doesn't break at all and that's more like how the the gripping is it, you kind of uh, even if you have uh, pull 9 g's you can pull 9 g's for a long time it doesn't slow down at all oh really so that's a big so that that's uh, a big difference well it does if you have a lot of fuel of course or if you're really high up mm-hmm. uh but but compared to the vegan you can kind of he didn't lose as much when you turned. So, uh, and th- that was kind of, it was more physically, physically, uh, strenuous as well, of course, because you had, you could have a lot more G over the sortie. Of course. And yeah, let's talk about the cockpit and the gripping because it must've been vastly different from the Vigan, of course. And you've yeah. got that amazing, huge head up display. That must've been a massive, like difference coming from the Vigan. Oh yeah. We, for the fighter wagon, we actually had a head-up display, which is uh, that was pretty good, but the the gripping one was just per, just phenomenal, uh, the biggest one I've seen, and it's also very, uh, I mean, it's uh, it follows everything very smoothly, and uh, yeah, it's it's uh, perfect, and uh, of course the head-down displays they're they're large, and in the C version they're even uh, color and really really big. So yeah, I, I love the the real estate that you get because you can. When you do the BVR combat, you, you, as I said, it's like playing chess. And the bigger chess board, it's it's uh, it's easier when you have a bigger chess board. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's uh, that really made a difference. And I know that like the displays in the gripping, obviously, like um, before the E and F model, um, would they be interchangeable, or was it like one set for one thing and another for another, or could you interchange them? In the beginning, they were kind of set. After a while, some features came. So if, if one uh, screen was shut down, you could kind of move things in right. between. Uh, so, And there were also some kind of backup modes. And so you, you could change a little bit. I, I don't remember exactly what kind of changes you could do because they were separated. So the left two were yeah. kind of one system and the right one and the HUD was one system. But... Uh, when it comes to the the echo version of course everything is much more com- configurable yeah i think yeah uh, yeah the e and f model um it's like it's basically a big ipad isn't it is that essentially what oh it yeah is? yeah yeah <laughs> looks and impressive. That, that's yeah and it's good for flexibility as well i mean having three big screens there that's really good but having one big screen that's uh, that that thing makes it easier for the guys that makes all the graphics uh, to to make it kind of work because sometimes you want it on just a little screen and sometimes you want it on let's say two screens when you flew what was it like to fly with like other nato nations yeah we're we're, uh, with the grip and we flew against uh, or against or with the uh, norwegians and the Finns a lot and also uh, the danes and they uh, the, the Norwegians and Danes had the F-16 and the Finns had the F-18. So I've been flying against F-16s and F-18s a couple of times and also in air, air combat maneuvering. And I'm so, going to have to push you on this, uh, Duke, because, yeah. oh. <laughs> because I know our viewers are going to want it. Who came out on top against, you know, Griffin versus F-16, Griffin versus F-18? What, what was the outcome? I know every situation is different, but... Yeah, give our viewers something here. <laughs> a fighter pilot have never lost. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think uh, the, the Gripen does very well against uh, both the F-16 and the F-18. They are, they are similar uh, aircraft, but especially the, the Gripen and the F-16. They are similar in size, yeah. similar in, uh, uh, in in engine power. The Gripen does carve better in, in through the air, and the, the F-16, I would say, it's a tad older i mean it's a decade older or two and it, it has a little bit towards the tendency uh, that the vegan had that it stops a little bit when you you pull g's a yeah. little bit like that so uh, and and the gripen doesn't because it's, it has the the canards and everything that makes it really carve through there mm-hmm. so so you, you can hold, definitely uh, hold your own if you're a good pilot in the gripen and and uh, then you you can win against the, the other, uh, other two. And you have to watch out with the F-18, though, because they have a, basically, I you can pull it. as much angle of attack yeah. as you want with that one. So if they have the option to, you know, go really high angle of attack and get a shot on you, then you're kind of toast. And th- that depends a little bit about the engagement rules. Can you just, you know, 
pull and shoot in all directions and all the angles and so on. But then, of course, they, they will re- if you have an 80 degrees angle of attack, you're basically standing still in there after that. So then, you, then you're uh, just a sitting duck. Yeah, you're done, yeah. Uh, and one of the thing, like, uh, just like uh, I'm going to give a shout out to Jello's uh, podcast, the Fighter Pilot podcast. Um, you mentioned, uh, I think Jello was asking about, he didn't uh, know the difference between, you know, like, oh, he couldn't really tell the difference between uh, Rafael Typhoon and the Gripen. And I think you, you mentioned, you said that at least the Gripen looks good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I thought it was a really great comment. <laughs> I really like that. Uh, yeah, Duke, did you ever fly the Gripen in live operations or in a live theatre? Yeah, I flew it uh, over Libya, the 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 operation down in Libya. And I, I was actually, that, that's kind of the, the height of my career, I think, because... I was allowed to lead the first sortie into Libya uh, wow. from the Swedish side. So I, I, I actually have a, the first sortie there was uh, kind of interesting because uh, I had the, we, we didn't have, because of reasons that we shouldn't go into probably, but we had, a, we started with the not full aircraft when it comes to fuel. Yeah. And uh, so we had, and we didn't have fuel at the base because it was compatible in the beginning, incompatible at the, at the beginning. But our C-130, Hercules, it had, uh, we could go to a civilian airport and get the right kind of fuel for us. Right, right. But we, we started with, you know, almost a bingo fuel after takeoff. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, so we, uh, the, the thing was that we, we actually had on the C-130 that was started, we had the, the chief of the whole Swedish Air Force, Ooh. and on, as my wingman was my squadron commander. <laughs> <laughs> Pressure's on. Uh, yeah, pressure was pretty pretty much on at the time, and and also we heard that you, you can't fail this mission because uh, well it's both a political and it's the first mission that Sweden has done abroad for fifty years, and we we, we must we must do this correctly. And also, uh, you are not allowed to go under bingo fuel because, well, that's in our rule book. So it's kind of squeezed from all sides here. So just yeah. after takeoff, and, and I was kind of getting, um, we're, we're used to, you start up the engine and then you kind of request from the tower to uh, to taxi and then you get out in five minutes. But in Sigonella in Italy at the time, it took 45 minutes uh, before wow. I, you kind of the initial and, and the, the aircraft was still running, so it was consuming more and more, uh, consuming all the fuel. Yeah. So we had even less fuel than than planned. So that was kind of a, a sweaty moment. And so I remember they, the C one hundred and thirty. They started, and uh, we started as soon as we could, just after that. And they flew as as slow as they could, and we flew as fast as we could, but not too fast because then you consume a lot of fuel, of course. Yeah. And then you have the delta speed and everything, so you, you don't want to come in too fast and overshoot. Okay. And uh, at the t- before that, I got the bingo fuel uh, sound in, in my ears, and I knew that probably my wing uh, com- uh, squadron commander had it as well. And I was speaking on the, on the radio, and the sound from the bingo fuel went out on the frequency. And <laughs> well, it was, all, yeah, it was all, a whole mess. But some creative uh, uh, calculate because it's all the, the aircraft can just help you with the calculations, but it's me that do the, the actual calculations. So... You had to be a little creative in the in the calculations there, but finally we we, we uh, hooked up and uh, at the first try, and it all went good from from there. But it was really exciting. Wow, that's very hairy. <laughs> yeah, not not hairy in the it's dangerous kind of way, but hairy in the you have yeah. to. Succeed. <laughs> So yeah, like this is just a side note here, Duke. Um, so yeah, what was the role of the gripping in that mission? Was you, were you going from air to ground or air to air, or what, what was the role? We started out in uh, in DCA, uh, defensive counter air, basically protecting the 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 air refuel fleet and uh, the AWACSs because nobody knew about Sweden. What can you do? Well, you got the gripping. Nobody knew exactly what the grippens could do so we kind of started there to show ourselves and uh well are they trusted and uh, how do they um, fare in, in, in international uh operations like this so uh, a couple of sorties then we uh, we had a, a, a totally fantastic uh, recce pod it t- takes really really good pictures so after a while we we got some uh, sorties to take pictures over sam sites and so on 
Wow. And those pictures actually turned out um, together with the fantastic job from our uh, mission support element uh, guys that was actually looking at the pictures and writing reports about them. It was really okay. professional. Wow. So when those reports started going into the NATO headquarters, they said, well, wow, they, we don't have this. So, And we were basically shifted from DCA, which was kind of anyone can do that, that has an AMRAM uh, strapped to their aircraft. And we started doing more uh, recce missions. We, we didn't have an allowance from the Swedish government to do air-to-ground uh, missions, though. So that was kind of out of the question for us. So how many hours did you acquire on the Gripen? 600 hours on the Gripen as well. Uh, uh, yeah, so it's even split between the Grippens and uh, the Viggins. Yeah, so like, what was the best part or the funnest part of flying the Gripen? Well... Flying in general is, I mean, you uh, have awesome. your own road. Yeah, exactly. It's, it, you have your own roller coaster, so to say, and it's really fun flying. But I think uh, flying with the Gripen is, I, I really, really enjoy the chess game, which means the BVR, the Beyond Visual Range uh, Combat, because that's a kind of a, a, a more like a, you, 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 you're, you're competing against the brain of the other pilot, other yeah. pilots on the other side, more like, more than having your own roller coaster, which yeah. is kind of fun to, to start with. But after a couple of years, well, that kind of gets old. But the have the BVR uh, combat never gets old. That that's kind of what what's really fun, and and that got really you can do that really well with the Grippens. So that's why I love that. And it sounds like you've had an amazing career on both the Viggen and Gripen. Not jealous at all, Duke here. <laughs> <laughs> but you've had a, an amazing career. But uh, um, I, we've got some uh, questions from our Patreons, if you're happy to answer them. Sure, sure. So this is from Joe Kunzler. What's the air-to-ground uh, weapons load? I wonder if the Gripen could take on a SAM site. Yeah, that... Um, I guess it, there's a difference between what we have bought in the Swedish Air Force and what you can carry on the Gripens, because uh, other countries have uh, other sets of uh, uh, weapons. Uh, in the Swedish Air Force, at least for the Charlie and Delta versions, which we fly now, well, you, we have the, it's called the Paveway 2 GBU-12, which is basically yeah. just a laser-guided bomb. And then the GBU-49, which is a GPS version of that. So you can kind of drop bombs on everything. But it has a disadvantage that you have to be quite close to the target that yeah. you're dropping bombs on. So in a context where you want to uh, engage a SAM site, that might not be mm, optimal, so to say. Uh, especially if the SAM site has some range. Then you want to have some standoff. Uh, standoff. Then and, and for that, we have the GBU, I think it's called 39, which is the small diameter bomb. That they can glide in. There's a smaller bomb, but they have small wings, so they can glide, and they have GPS as well. So basically, you enter the GPS coordinates, and they glide in. Uh, but that's just what we have in the Swedish Air Force. Then uh, in the Echo version, and just ordered for the Swedish Air Force as well, is standoff weaponry. And I mean, you you can have this for the current Gripens as well. Just just that Swedish Sweden never ordered it. But we, uh, it, the Gripen works with the, I think the Cap 350. Uh, not sure if it works out of the box with the Jasm, Jasm standoff weapon as well. But mm -hmm. basically, those are cruise missiles, uh, so you can uh, defeat SAM sites. But you have to know, of course, where they are, and that's the problem. If they're moving, uh, if there's a, a mobile SAM site, then we, there's a lot of more, a lot more than just the weapons that you have to have in place. You have to have the intelligence and everything. Of course, yeah. So hopefully that's answered your question there, Joe. And um, this one's from uh, Jin Zanjuk. Um, out of all the four generation plus uh, aircraft, the Gripen is quoted as the most underpowered with low level, uh, low specific excess thrust. How does this affect tactics in DACT against higher uh, thrust to weight ratio jets like the Typhoon and the Rafale? Yeah, there's two versions of that. The one is that today, basically, uh, it's not so much about the the dogfighting. I mean, today we have weapons that uh, already we had for 10 years. We have the Iris T, for instance, yeah, which is yeah. uh, 
everything, and we've got the head-mounted display. So everything you can see, if you can see it, it they're probably within 15 kilometers. Yeah. So then you can, and then and then you can just see it, and you press a button, and they're dead. There's no way out of that. Mm-hmm. So there's no reason really to you know do the Top Gun trying to get in behind one each other, one one another. That's really good fun exercising though. That's that's m- probably one of the most you know fun, but it's more more like the roller coaster fun than the the, the, the use, use your brain kind of fun. So that's one thing that you don't need it that much. What you need power to weight ratio is is uh, is actually to to have high speed, and that's in the BVR scenarios. Yeah, you want to have a lot of speed so you can give your missiles, your long range or your medium range missiles, a lot of initial initial speed. Then they go longer. Then you want to pull some Gs, but then you don't have to pull too many Gs because it doesn't matter if you pull three or four or nine Gs when you're kind of 100 kilometers away or, or uh, 60 miles away from someone. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't affect your outcome. Yeah. So then the Gs, Gs doesn't really uh, matter. So then you, have, you, you just want a high speed. And since the Gripen, they're kind of light and they're, kind of very, they're very slippery and they do the carving that I said. You can still... You, it, it do it does Mac two, yeah, and that's just that, that that's enough. And the Grip and E even do Super Cruise, so uh, um, you, you got you got enough. It's I would say that that's it's kind of common to think that you can kind of rate the aircraft how good they are in combat by looking at the numbers, what the thrust to weight yeah. ratio is, and that's like looking at a, a player in football and say, well, he's this strong and he can run this fast, so he must be the best one. It's totally almost agree. an alley, but it's what you have on the inside and your decision support system and your EV suit and everything. That's what really counts. And nobody's actually telling exactly what you have there. But I can tell you that the Gripen has a really good package in those areas. So we've got another question here from one of our patrons here, Duke, uh, from Alexander. Uh, did you ever get the chance to fully utilize the Gripen's supposedly fantastic ECM suite? Yeah, uh, we've used it against each other, of course, and I'm not personally been on red flag, but I know that other pilots on my squadron and in the Air Force have been on red flags many times, and they have great success with the the EC, with the electronic warfare suit, and that it's supposed to be one of the best, and maybe the best, but of course, everybody is keeping their cards really close to yeah, their, course, yeah. <laughs> you know, to their body when it comes to this, so it's really hard to say, but we know that... Uh, well, if we turn it on, then they don't see us very well. So that probably look, has to count for something, at least. And especially for the the, the ground-based air defense, they, they have a really hard time trying to, to uh, lo- lock onto us, basically. Yeah, of course. Well, hopefully uh, Duke's answered your questions there for our patrons, but I've got a couple of personal questions, if you're happy to do that, Duke. Sure, sure. Right, so do you have any hobbies? Hobbies, uh, yeah, computers. computers. <laughs> yes. I, I, uh, it hasn't actually uh, come up in this interview, but I'm actually uh, one of the n- computer nerdiest persons that you probably know because I've I've actually start, I started uh, programming programming computers when I was ten, oh, and wow. I've never stopped. So I, I have always had my own computer company at the side. That's where I'm working now. Oh man! Uh, so uh, yeah, and, and I'm doing computer programming. And I've always had that on the side. So I actually have a flight planning computer system, a flight planning system that I sell through another company. And now we have, a, a, we're programming, a, a, well, it's, it's decision support system for uh, fighter aircraft, basically. So we, we're taking my piloting skills and my uh, computer programming skill and some of the, the best engineers uh, sitting next to me here and some AI, and we're doing a decision support system for that. So that's my that's my hobby, that is working and working with computers. So uh, I'm a big nerd. Big nerd. We all nerds, but maybe we're looking at the, the future Elon Musk. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> I do drive a Tesla. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So, Duke, uh, yeah, favorite aircraft you have flown in your career? I've flown. Well, I haven't flown flown that many. I've flown the Swedish aircraft. I've flown the F sixteen, and I really like the side stick on that one. Actually, it was kind of similar to to the to the oh, Gripen. Well, we and to, well, uh, can you share that story? Like, how did that come about? Before I like, sure. wrap up. Oh, 
Yeah, yeah, it was uh, uh, an exercise in Norway uh, when just uh, before I went to Libya in I think it was 2010. So a two seat uh, version of the F-16, and we had some kind of uh, some guys of them flew in the back seat in Grippens, and we flew in back seat in their F-16s. And it was a, a real mission, but not a, a live mission, but uh, exercise mission. And I flew from the back seat almost the whole story, and I, I loved it. And it was we uh, even did some. Uh, close, uh, uh, advanced f- uh, flying, holding hands afterwards. And uh, I flew from the back seat with the, uh, the, the very stiff stick on the F-16. And it was handled beautifully, and uh, it was really similar to flying the, the Gripen, actually. So I, I really liked it. Is there an aircraft you would have loved to have flown or would like to fly in the future? Yeah, the SR-71. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> the micro. I love speed, so... Yeah, Yeah. well, well it's a beautiful... Uh, it's a fantastically beautiful air- aircraft for to start with, and it goes really fast, which is also good. But then also, I really love the story about it, because they were kind of skunk works, and it was uh, done in a really short time, and it was amazing performance, and it was also... You know, crafted for one one single purpose, and it was really ahead of its time. And uh, well, there's a lot of a lot of reasons, but I, I really love that aircraft. So, Duke, can we find you online anywhere? Yeah, I'm uh, I'm at Twitter. It's usually Swedish though, so it might be hard to decode <laughs> unless you speak <laughs> Swedish. But yeah, but of course, I, I, I if someone has questions or so, I'm happy to answer them in English. So uh, no worries, uh, all Swedes basically speak English, so no problem. But my uh, my handle there is at m i k a e l g r e v. So it's my name basically, just uh, as as it is, yeah. and you can find it, find me there. That's I think that's the only place that I'm at. Perfect, and I'll link that in the description below, guys. But. Uh... Yeah, Duke, what a pleasure to talk to you and hear about your fantastic career flying uh, two of, like, you know, the Swedish legends, the Gripen and the Viggen. So thank you very much for coming on the show. It's been uh, great to talk to you. Thank you, Mike.